So now let me uh, let me introduce our our speaker. We are very happy that Ravinder Kaur who has uh, is introducing our uh, semester. Uh, she is an associate professor of uh, modern South Asian studies and directs the Center of Global South Asian uh, Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, her work is wide ranging and works across the disciplines of history, anthropology and international politics. And uh, her most recent uh, work delves into the transformation of post-colonial India into an attractive investment destination in the global economy. Uh, and uh, this work is based into, you know, uh, turned into a, a very recent book uh, called Brand New Nation, uh, published by Stanford University Press uh, last year. Uh, her previous uh, research focused on India's mid-20th century transformation, and uh, some of that work was published uh, in a book called Since 1947, Partition Narratives Among the Punjabi Migrants of Delhi. Uh, and uh, she has numerous other uh, you know, uh, articles and publications to her credit, and uh, is, uh, also holds the Carlsberg Foundation Semper Ardens Monograph Fellowship. Uh, so please join me in uh, welcoming uh, uh, Ravinder Kaur. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Iftikhar, Daniel and Gloria for inviting me to Isaka. And I, I, I really like your screens and uh, the campus looks absolutely stunning and beautiful. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to begin my talk uh, you know, my screen, I will I begin the screen share. Daniel, I just hope I'm able to do that. Uh, yes. Is this visible? Yes, oh, it no. is. Yeah, it works yeah. now. Yeah, it works now. Okay, great. Okay, so I just wanted to begin by saying that uh, those of you who may be following uh, you know, the Indian news uh, uh, today, they would know that uh, the it's the budget session in the parliament, uh, which is unfolding. And everything which is going on is all about the economic survey and uh, all the growth which is sitting uh, and waiting for us in the future. And I think it is this kind of future projection that I'm going to talk about, uh, which I call uh, today the art of brand India, and I'm going to speak art in multiple senses. Art, of course, as in artistic images, but also the entire policy politics of creating uh, what I call the economy of hope. So what I'm going to do is to throw out a few ideas for you, and hopefully there will be uh, some discussions uh, following that. And of course, my talk is based on my recent work, which is called uh, the brand new nation. So I, I will begin with this image, which is simply called open for business. And you can see an exclamation mark here. And it says www.incredibleindia.org. This image was released in 2003. And basically, I'm going to lay out the whole idea of transformation uh, of the nation state into a market. Uh, basically, let me begin with this then. So the basic questions that I'm going to address today are that how, when and how did India become an emerging market or an investment destination? What kind of identity politics has shaped and been shaped in return by the capitalization of the nation state? Or how do we explain the rise of Hindu majoritarian politics from the embers of globalization and liberal markets as a mean to recover a mythical golden Hindu past? I return here to this image which simply says open for business. And most people would know that when you, this is a kind of sign which is hung outside commercial establishments, shops. But what does it mean when such a sign is hung outside a nation state? What does it mean for India to be open for business and what kind of transformations uh, uh, lay behind, uh, uh, lay ahead of us. So to discuss this, I'm going to return to a moment in 1990s, which was a moment of fragile hope and anxiety in India. The nation had just opened up its economy to join the world of free markets, a post Cold War end of history of a, a world of global free markets. 
the formula was seductive. It held out the promise of foreign investments, high economic growth, and of unleashing the uncaged spirit of Indian enterprise. It also promised more consumer choices to Indian citizens, dreams of a better life, and most of all, a chance to set the nation's course to resplendent 21st century futures. The forward march to market liberalization entailed a break away from India's old legacy of economic nationalism. India's anti-colonial economics of Swadeshi, which literally means of one's own nation or self-reliance. Swadeshi had dominated Indian economic policy and thinking since national independence, and it prioritized the autonomy of, of, of over the nation's resources. The boycott of foreign made goods was the most popular expression of Swadeshi politics, if you recall. But in the 1990s, the Swadeshi began to be offended, even seen as a vestige of the past, holding back India from economic prosperity. So new Indian economic policy in 1990 threw open the consumer market to foreign goods. Swadeshi school economic thinkers termed it as the, I quote, Coca colonization of India, unquote. Coca-Cola in this dramatic transition to free market capitalism at once became a sign of worldly pleasures now available to Indian consumers, as well as the treachery of selling out to foreign corporations. Recall that in 1977, Coca-Cola had been banned by the Indian state. The company was subsequently turned into a nationalist venture that sold an Indian brand of soft drinks. A quarter of a century later, Coca-Cola was not only back in the newly liberalized India, it had also bought the Indian brand to expand its operations in the market. Recall uh, drinks like Thumbs Up here. The corporate sale of the Indian soft drink brands to Coca-Cola was an illustration of how the logic of liberalization and globalization had displaced the principles of Swadeshi economic nationalism. The free market lobby, it was ruefully remarked, had, I quote, sold out to big business, unquote, and sullied India's anti-colonial dream of economic independence. Though the advocates of Swadeshi and socialists contested liberalization in the 1990s, few had grasped the full consequences of India's transition to free market capitalism. At this point, the socialist and Swadeshi resistance aimed to prevent the opening of Indian consumer market to foreign goods and the foreign takeover of Indian companies. Yet liberalization of India proved more than the question of consumer goods or companies. The nation state in the 21st century global economy was itself undergoing a capitalist transformation into a lucrative commodity, an enclosure of global market, of global capital. Already in the 1990s, India had begun courting foreign capital to rejuvenate its economy through global investment programs. What initially began as a push to sell made in India goods in global markets would soon turn into a question of make in India, a project that sought to reconfigure India as a veritable factory of the world for global manufacturing. At the turn of the millennium, a historic publicity campaign called India Shining launched India as an investment hotspot in the global markets. The mediatized projection of India disclosed the inner workings of how India was being reorganized as a market. The campaign name India Shining was more than just publicists' hyperbole. It was an accurate description of post-colonial India's transformation to capitalism. Please pay attention to this image which I'm showing for you. This is again a campaign image from India Shining campaign. Opportunity has a new geography. When global companies look at India, they see more than the vastness of a market. They see the power of a nation that can drive a whole new world economy. This is that hopeful, optimistic moment, which is uh, around about 2003, four, just when economic reforms were showing gains. So the India shining metaphor promised India's great transformation into a brand new nation. That is a refuge for global capital made available through state-led investment programs. The infusion of capital made India shine in the th theater of world economy, a luster kept alive by profits the investors hope to generate. 
It entailed too a transformation of the nation into a fully capitalized income generating asset, or in the language of policy experts, structural adjustments and lowering of trade barriers, all aided and abetted by the global financial institutions and facilitated by the state. This move altered the old compact between nation and state. Once structurally adjusted, the nation was to become a site of production. Its territory, a reserve of untapped natural resources, its population, a demographic dividend that both produced and consumed, and its culture, a unique brand identity. The great state power rearranged the nation as a market-ready investment destination. The glue that bound the nation and the state together was the optimistic vision of economic growth and prosperity, the erasure of the colonial shame, and even restoration of a mythical golden Hindu past, as I'm going to later talk about. The past decade or so, the India, Indian nation brand identity has increasingly foregrounded an ancient Hindu past to fashion a unique cultural identity in the global economy. What began as a soft power push to overhaul India's image in the world in the 1990s eventually became an instrument to strengthen the Hindu nationalist claims to represent the authentic pre-Muslim spirit of the nation. This ongoing transformation of the nation state provides yet another counterexample to the enduring myth of the extinction of the nation state into the flat world of free markets. Proponents, proponents long imagined globalization that is shorthand for unrestrained mobility of capital, goods, people, and ideas as a world in motion and open-ended market trade sans barriers making national borders superfluous. This is the discourse we have grown up with in the last uh, uh, three decades or so. So the story of globalization itself has been told in the language of movements. It's all about flows, motions, networks, mobility, circulations and fluidity, which conjure a world permanently on the move. So the India shining imagery discloses something which is often overlooked in the euphoria of globalization, that is the nation state had not only defied the predictions of its end, it was undergoing a spectacular makeover to become a capitalist growth story in the global economy. The nation state in its commodity form, that is brand India, was maintaining its role as a key actor despite predictions of its retirement. This shift especially became apparent in the old third world. It's not just India, this wave has been going along in, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which at the turn of the millennium was imagined by global financial institutions and, in, and investors as a frontier emerging market in the capitalist geography. The turning point was the 1990s triumph of liberalism in Euro-America that energized the contentious project of neoliberal reforms in the global South. With the counterweight of communism gone, the script of liberal economic reforms was pitched as the only viable future for the developing world. The post-colonial and post-communist nations were encouraged by think tanks and financial institutions to make structural adjustments and open up their markets to foreign capital investments. This formula not only promised economic prosperity, to the post-colony, but also a chance to fulfill its future as a great power, to win a seat at the table of global politics. Now, India was the forerunner among the post-colonial uh, nations that cautiously embraced the liberal project of capitalist reforms, a momentous event given its sheer complexity and size in the, in the world economy. By the early 21st century, the liberalization of the Indian economy had been popularly dubbed as the India story of millennium capitalist growth that promised good times to the citizens and profits to the investors. The transformation of the nation form raises the question, what does it mean to love the nation in its 21st century form? Now to ask this question already seems an aberration, almost a sacrilege, given that the idea of the nation is at odds with commodification and market transactions. After all, the nation has long been imagined as a sacred object of worship. 
our dynamic moral spiritual project with a common history of love and suffering. The origins of 19th century cultural nationalism precisely lay in the imagination of nations as organic being, living personalities that demanded sacrifice and devotion, a special kind of love that exceeded all others to sustain this virtual person. Nationalists presume the nation to be a unique person with inalienable civilizational essence and a timeless history and its territory personified as a sacred being. So to love the nation then was to celebrate the spirit of the people, the national romance that embraced natural landscapes and its ethnic inhabitants. The ultimate expression of nationalism was to die for its cause, the martyrdom. For Indians engaged in the anti-colonial struggle, the figure of the mother goddess Bharat Mata, a feminine embodiment of India's territorial expanse, served as a sacred object of devotion and sacrifice. So how could the sacred nation be put at the disposal of investors in the global marketplace? The answer is counterintuitive, I suggest that what renders the nation transcendental and open to exchange in the market is the imagining of the nation as a living organism, a unique being that can be dressed up as a branded investment destination. If the natural landscape is full of untapped natural resources and the people are consumers and producers, the nation's cultural identity is turned into a corporate brand identity. So to love and be devoted to the nation then means to work to enhance the brand value and economic potential of the nation. It means adding value to the nation by projecting it as a profitable market ready investment destination. So the logic of 19th century cultural nationalism is turned upside down here. Far from corroding the celebrated spirit of the nation, it's the nation's market value as a profit generating commercial enclosure, which becomes a mode of affirming the worthiness of the people as a great nation. The more the brand nation, a brand new nation attracts and generates capital, the more it legitimizes its aura, claims of a sense, its identity as the chosen people and natural ties with the landscape. The infusion of capital then continually generates something that far exceeds the capital, the aura, spirit, or the non-extractable difference that is plowed back to generate brand capital. In short, the cultural difference distilled into a corporate brand is put to work to generate capital and capital in return enhances the claims of cultural uniqueness. So the commodification of the nation consecrates to the very idea of state sovereignty in ever new forms. The visual power to celebrate the, the revitalized nation and to see and show the national territory and its population as valuable factors of production available to global capital. Consider the brand India publicity material, which I'm going to show, which mostly appears as a repackaging of the familiar cultural exotica. I, I before I just move into these images, this is, uh, these are images from the, you know, covers of The Economist. Oh, there were, I'm sorry, I missed. Uh, basically, this shows that the story of globalization as something which comes from outside, uh, uh, you know, is not simply true because this is both a push and pull uh, of how capital has come become the main logic of the nation state here, celebrating India's place in the world as the number one destination for foreign capital. And this is a picture from my field work, which I conducted at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, many people would recognize, uh, you know, those who are sitting in this image. Uh, these are the billionaires of India, uh, you know, the major industrialists. So basically they are talking about at India Adda, uh, which is basically uh, uh, translated in the global uh, uh, setting as an Indian hangout where you discuss uh, you know, the future of the nation. And this is direct telecast uh, on Economic uh, Times TV. So here I, 
come to a series of images. Many of these images are iconic. They are well recognized. And uh, some of them go under a campaign called India Shining, as you will see. And uh, these iconic imageries, they, they almost are like poetry because when we speak about economics, we usually speak about charts, tables, graphs, numbers, statistics. But what you see over here in this massive publicity campaign is that uh, the policy material is translated into poetry which can be sold to the public. So this is, this is the art of publicity that we are speaking about, which, uh, which speaks about, let me read out, mothers have never been happier. Prices are stable, quality has risen, choices are plenty, financing schemes are easy, and your budgets are, aren't getting upset. Besides, interest rates on home loans have come down and there's never been a better time to buy your own house. With India ready to progress even further, your tomorrow looks wonderful. So go ahead, gain from these excellent times, build your dreams, spread the enthusiasm and make India stronger and shine even brighter. So this is just one example. So this is the theme of the idea that India is shining, be proud of it. So this is not just about uh, uh, you know, the idea that uh, you know, foreign capital comes. What we are witnessing over here is a massive change in uh, you know, what it means to be an Indian, to belong to India, and how India is being reshaped, uh, as we will continue seeing, a particular ki kind of identity which continues to shape up. Just a few more. Here, this campaign called Indian in Incredible India, which must be familiar to everyone. Because even when you uh, travel to India and you have to fill up the form, immigration form, Incredible India is stamped right over there. And here, what you see is um, a woman uh, who could as well be in Los Angeles or some foreign setting in her lycra clad uh, uh, dress. And she's in a, in a yoga pose, which is called Brikshasan. And the, and the locale that you can see is the Himalayan uh, range. And I'll continue. Here, Incredible India. What you also please pay attention to is how I has been turned upside down and the idea of incredibility, the text is woven into the image and of course the natural scenery uh, behind it. And it's that element which will continue here. Here you can see again, the, you know, the stripe uh, is uh, you know, incorporated into this notion of incredibility. And uh, here, of course, is an image, uh, you know, one of the chapters in my book where I'm, you know, where I discuss the whole notion of a smart image for India and uh, which I, which I call remixing history. And uh, so often I would ask, what does it mean, you know, to be smart in terms of an image? So to be smart, I mean, this was one example that, uh, you know, when you can uh, poke fun at yourself. So here it was all about not, not all Indians are polite, hospitable and vegetarian. Of course, uh, many of these images are made, as I said, in 2002, three, four and five. And when we uh, see them today, uh, especially in terms of, uh, you know, the whole beef, uh, you know, anti-beef uh, uh, project which is going on or cow protection. I mean, this, this seems a little bit ironic uh, to watch this. Likewise, there are many, many more images of incredible India where you begin to redefine, reimagine territory in terms of its incredible, uh, incredibility. And then of course, I'm going to come to this. What is crucial to this cultural politics, which we have just witnessed of brand making is not just what is inside the image frame, but what is kept outside of it. That is the near absence of Muslim figures of symbols in the brand India imagery. It's an omission that creates a default Hindu cultural mainframe through which to see and show India. If there is an exception to this trend, it is the contentious presence of Taj Mahal. It is this image. The 16th century Mughal monument built in Indo-Islamic style on the cultural battlefield of Hindu nationalism, Taj Mahal is deemed a trace 
of the foreign and inauthentic representation of India in the world. It is a permanent thorn in Hindu nationalist politics, but one that cannot easily be evicted from the brand India. The monument is not only India's prime tourist attraction, but also a world heritage site that generates steady profits. So it's a strange twist that it is not the secular politics of multiculturalism, but the capitalist logic of profit making that allows the precarious presence of Taj Mahal within brand India. The capitalist logic of brand India then extends far beyond selling the nation to investors. It has not only furthered the Hindu nationalist agenda to create a unified cultural identity, it has also rearranged the social political landscape. Critical to this transformation is how brand making opens up a fractious politics of visual re-territorialization of the nation. Who are the chosen people who inhabit the visual surface of the nation brand? Which cultural practices and ideas are left out of the frame, concealed from the eyes of the world? Who owns the nation and its natural and cultural possessions? And who has the power to capitalize these possessions? If the visual frame of the nation brand is a form of public recognition of the nation's cultural essence, then that unique difference acquires legitimacy precisely by being chosen for illumination by the state. It is here that brand India imagery assumes significance. The predominant choice of pre-Muslim Hindu cultural practices in the image frame eventually becomes the cultural mainframe of the nation. The very act of illumination of cultural Hinduism as symbolic of modern India marginalizes all other religious groups and multicultural identity of post-colonial India. Witness how the idea of India and Hindu is increasingly, increasingly conflated in public imagination. The secular and egalitarian roots of the old anti-colonial nationalism are giving way to unabashed Hindu nationalism that neither brooks dissent nor is willing to share power with the minority groups. The state as the image machine then asserts its power by claiming proprietary control over the material and cultural possessions of the nation, and more importantly, the power to market them to global investors. This control clearly demarcates the domestic affairs as a forbidden territory for external actors. The tacit bargain is this, the state manages and facilitates capital mobility and return retains the power to rearrange the domestic sphere without external interference or sanctions. This transaction became apparent, especially in August 2019, when the Indian government revoked the special autonomous status of Kashmir. Two developments took place simultaneously. The region was shut down in a curfew and internet, internet blackout to stymie political protests. And at the same time, it opened up for business. The revocation was accompanied by an official announcement of an investor summit that invited investors to witness firsthand, I quote, the business friendly policies of the government assess infrastructure, natural resources, raw material and skilled and unskilled manpower and identify business opportunities in the state. If the prospect of accessing a new market, an untapped site of production and consumption was welcomed by the Indian capital, the foreign capital and policymakers chose to over the, overlook this act for the fear of losing Indian market. So it is hardly a surprise that India's march to become the factory of the world, that is a space of a global space of production that contains natural resources, cheap skilled labor, technology, as well as a vast consumer market is deeply entangled with pro capital Hindu majoritarianism. Now this is all counterintuitive that how something which is deemed liberal, open, free can be entangled with illiberal majoritarianism. At the heart of this alliance then is the pursuit of economic growth a project that calls for discipline, even obedience to the strongman leader who means business in more ways than one. Than one. The strongman appeal of Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, as a hyper-masculine Hindu leader is what earned him, first earned him endorsement of the captains of industry. The capital has always indeed rooted for authoritarian leaders who can not only capture resources and put them at the disposal of investors, but also ensure a permanent supply of good news to celebrate the growth story of the nation. 
This is where the domains of politics, economy, and publicity come together to shape the contours of pro-capital Hindu nationalism. This special kind of love for the brand new nation requires a steady channeling of positive, uplifting images in the global public sphere. It also means overlooking and countering negative images that might harm the nation's brand value in the world. This need for compulsory good news to keep optimism alive is at, lot, uh, is at odds with the structures of democracy. After all, the heart of democracy is dissent. A practice that involves criticism, disagreement, and even expressions of disobedience. This contradiction has created a rupture and a new political category of dissidents through the logic of the brand, which is the anti-nationals, you may have heard of that category. The ones who corrode the brand value of the nation by exposing the negatives, the communal violence, caste atrocities, and poverty otherwise buried beneath the good news. So I'm going to end with an unusual image. And now I have a lot more, as you can see, I, I can return to that. It is this image that I would like to end with. This is an image which stands out in the spectacular cat catalog of Brand India. It's an advertisement that sells India to the global investment, investors, but barely mentions it. Yet in doing so, it captures a key transformative moment in the making of 21st century nation and nationalism from the embers of globalization. Look at the image frame. Designed in early 2004, the advertisement reproduces, uh, reproduces an old drawing titled Columbus Discovers America 1492 with a bold new caption. I quote, the last time we held so much promise, Columbus discovered America, unquote. It features an artistic portrayal of Christopher Columbus's arrival on the shores of the new world. Columbus and his crew are depicted, depicted as overjoyed and exhausted, thankful for having found the land of promise after a long and arduous journey. The text accompanying the drawing reads, I quote, when Columbus sailed, uh, set sail to find the rich spices of our land, Destiny had other plans. Instead of finding us, he discovered America. Years later, modern day explore, explorers have got our incredible land back on their maps. Because today we are among the globe's fastest growing economies and opportunities are endless for global corporate captains, investors, marketers, exporters, and tourists. The weather today is just perfect to sail for our beautiful shores. Our country is shining and you have never had a better time to shine together." Unquote. The hint that this bountiful land of opportunity was India, was the discrete presence of icons of the Indian national flag, which you can see, and the official emblem and the website address www.indiashining.com at the bottom. This poetic invitation of India shining to sail for our beautiful shores was designed to draw the attention of a powerful consumer group global investors and policymakers to India. It was witty and effective in the highly speculative arena of finance capital, where post-colonial nations turn emerging markets compete for foreign investments. The sales pitch was direct. That is, India, the old profitable commodity, was once again available in the global marketplace. The visual sign of India's ongoing commodification into an investment destination was the presence of Columbus. Here, Columbus served to rekindle the old desire for legendary India that had once moved Europeans to undertake a dangerous expedition across the ocean. India Shining promised investors that they could succeed where Columbus and other Europeans of the age of discovery had failed. They could tap into India's great resources and wealth India may have eluded Columbus, but it was now inviting capital to the great price. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Ravinder. Uh, I think uh, uh, if, um, if the audience would like to, to have questions or comments, you can either uh, uh, post them in the, uh, in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, so I see a hand already. So uh, by Aisha Mathan. Uh, 
Uh, go ahead, Aisha. Thank you so much, Professor Ford, for your talk. Um, so I wanted to uh, sort of, you know, uh, ask you, you know, in your book, you underscore India being projected as a unified cultural political identity. You talk about uh, competitive federalism of drawing futures, um, of tapping into the archive of propaganda, uh, you know, of the propaganda narrative, uh, and of inhabiting the long promised future um, and of nationality in um, I, I, I'd like to ask if you could shed light on what you discuss in chapter four, uh, which you title Icons of Good Time, which you, you know, uh, discuss in your talk today. And, and, uh, and the 2004 India Chinese uh, mm -hmm. project, uh, which resonates so closely with Achet Bin and the sort of journey, the decade long journey between 2004 and 2014. And then, of course, in chapter six, when you discuss uh, the Ahmadmi sort of phenomenon that comes to play. So, if you could sort of, I'm, I'm interested in the sort of the journey, uh, the sort of the rise of this project that moved from India China to Achebin and how that sort of uh, sort of grows, you know, how that sort of gains prominence despite the BJP being defeated in 2004, mm. it still gained mm. uh, prominence and, and, and eventually uh, become that table. Okay, uh, can I answer now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, I'm, I'm very happy that you have read my book. So it's always a great pleasure to hear that. I think um, um, basically, you see, when I started this project, um so many things um i mean it was simply i have been following this project for many years the the whole thing about you know india's transformation into an investment destination and the making of you know this whole imagery which has been produced and whatnot and i think along the way even i have been discovering things and i think uh, you know what you are mentioning here uh, you know, that uh, there is a certain kind of, uh, you know, there's a long genealogy we can draw here of this whole dream world of good times. As I said, you know, today is, uh, you know, the budget session, session in the parliament. And if you look at the economic survey, there are a host of projections and forecasts which are telling you that, uh, you know, good days are just lying ahead. So there are two or three things which we can see here that first of all, as we all know, BJP was defeated in 2004. And many of these images that I have shown, first of all, they cut across Congress and BJP across political lines. And that is something to note that this has become a project which has continued to shape India across political lines. And that is something uh, tremendously important, uh, you know, that the project of economic liberalization has come to stand. But of course, it is not the same what UPA was doing and what India is uh, doing. And that's number one. Number two, political parties may lose uh, again as BJP lost, but India shining continued in a totally new form, which is the return of Ache Din you know, the good times, uh, which uh, the Modi government promised, right? So that has, that has, that has a certain kind of longevity uh, in this. And uh, related to this is what I am again emphasizing the economy of hope. Namely that as we all know, the economic, actual economic figures are pretty grim. Anyone who even, you don't have to be an economist, all you have to do is to read daily newspapers and you sort of know where unemployment stands, uh, you know, inflation or, uh, you know, like um, what the general situation of the in economy is, right? So the, today there was a controversy about how do you measure, you know, the government is saying, oh, but so many cars were sold, but other people are saying, but well, 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 you know, two wheelers, uh, or, you know, ordinary people, they buy two wheelers, even that has really fallen down, right? So how do you really? So the whole thing, what I'm trying to say is the thing about 
uh, this kind of discourse that we are in or that this kind of politics that we are in, it is all about projections and forecasts of keeping up the spirits of always telling the good news of being positive. And this has nothing to do just with economics. It has also to do with our politics. Because when you say something critical, it is immediately taken as something you know, negative and negative is not like dissent is not tolerated, right? So I think it is, it is this overall, um, uh, uh, you know, a few of the threads that we can continue like, and many of these things which are happening are counterintuitive, counterintuitive in the sense that they go against the grain of what we were told would be the future of a globalized world the world of free markets or freedoms, which is going to somehow create peace and harmony. But as we all know, just the opposite has been taking place. But if we follow this trajectory, it is actually not that surprising, right? So this is, this is the argument that I've been trying to push forward that uh, anyone who has been following the ways in which the nations were being remade, they would not be surprised that why the so-called, uh, that entire edifice of uh, globalization has collapsed. I don't know if that answers, you know, your question. It does, thank you so much. So Durba, would you like to go next? Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, it's, uh, it's so persuasive and I completely, um, I think your images are fantastic. I mean, I think it's it's so persuasive. It's hard to imagine that we would think otherwise. And I think the part that I'm really thinking with is this idea of hope, right? Which I also want to just, you know, ask you to speak about um, a couple of ideas. Inequality has risen, right, very dramatically in these 30 years. And so one of the promises of this liberalized economy, right, was that it was going to bring in this this huge number of middle-class consumers who are now going to have extra resources, right? We know that's happened, but we also know that there's been a massive growth in inequality between the very wealthy and the very poor, not just in India, but globally. And so, you know, I think that's a kind of interesting feature of this politics, right? And the farmers' protest, I think, is a good kind of thing to think with, right? Um, that's more of a comment than a question, but I guess I wonder a little bit about whether um, you imagine there's a breaking point, right? Whether there's a moment where collectives say, actually, this hope is completely empty. This is this capital is not coming for me. It's not going to improve my life. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I just wondered about this totally different is um, I teach a the history of South Asia class and actually a couple of the students are in the audience and I shared a slide about those economist covers and I think you had more. And one of the students noticed that they're all animated with animals, tigers and elephants, ah. huh. right? I wonder um, if you just want to comment on that. And I didn't actually notice it until the student pointed it out, but I thought I'd put that question to you, which is sort of fascinating, right? And I thought your um, that slide that you have of the, the eye, yeah. fantastic, right? Because uh the eye is assumed we're supposed to be able to scan it and see what it means right but but the kind of close-up of the tiger is really compelling so those are just my two thoughts but thank you for a fantastic um presentation and, and book okay i have to thank you so much because you're right you know asking you know a couple of very important things i think first of all i'll begin with the animal imageries i actually have a whole chapter which is not in the book it is uh, written for, uh, you know, Sumiti Ramaswamy. She has edited a book. Uh, it is online already on part of the project. I can send you the link which, where I literally trace this question. You know, this whole actually, uh, where I basically showed the similarities between the financial, you know, the finance capital, the language of finance capital and the language of wildlife, colonialism, you know, something which we know from the jungle book, you know, of capturing this virgin territories or going into, you know, so the whole surprisingly, it, you know, it, again, it is a very counterintuitive thing to even think about, but if you know that literature, you know, like uh, colonial historiography, and then you go into this finance capital, it, it cannot but strike you that the representations of, uh, you know, emerging markets is all done in animal figures. So India, and it's not the same animal figures, by the way, India is represented both as an ele elephant and a tiger. 
And you can see the covers. I have made this whole analysis of the Economist covers because um, uh, you know, when India is shown to be like spirited, then it will be tiger. Or when they want to say, oh, but India, now come on, you know, up your game. It is dragging down, slowing down. Then it's, a, it's an elephant. Likewise for China, they have two figures. One is panda, the cute one. <laughs> The other is fiery dragon. So depending on what the mood is, <laughs> you know, that whether you want to. That's you know, fantastic. That sounds great. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm very happy to send you that uh, paper. It is online, yeah. but it is meant to be, it will be print, like published in a book in a, which is, a, it's called Manly Matters. So it's about masculinity. Uh, so the animal figures is right up there. I can continue recounting for you how, you know, Africa and wildlife territory. I mean, there are umpteen examples of that. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I actually dug a lot into the image making on the covers of Economist, but I could not print all of them because, uh, you know, they charge a lot of, uh, it cost a lot to reproduce them, but I have, have them in my stock. To the second thing, I think what you're asking about, uh, you know, hope, and already we know the gaps between, uh, you know, the dream world and the reality. And I think uh, I tried to write, uh, I was invited by Times of India to write an op-ed piece, but they never printed it. Uh, <laughs> so, so I called it the Indian dream. So because if you know, we speak about the American dream, which very well everyone is sort of aware about what it uh, stands for, but the Indian dream is very interesting because here we, you know, it's, it's another variation of the trickle down concept that we are so familiar with, that this idea of hope that has been generated in India. And what I mean by that is that uh, it is almost like a sacrilege if you do not show that you're hopeful. And what I'm struck about, and I want to write further about this, is that I'm struck by the fact that entire economic policy is driven through forecasts. Because you see, like, as I said, if you actually look at the facts and figures, it, it, they're dismal, they're grim. Anyone should be like, you know, people should be filled with anxiety as to what is happening to the country. But the fact it doesn't happen, uh, happens is because the whole discourse is driven through the language of optimism and hope. And it is seen as, so today, all I'm saying is everyone, um, like literally just go to any new sites, uh, new site in India, and just go and see, uh, don't look at what uh, some critical papers, you know, there may be some critical comments, but actually look at the posters which are being produced by the government of India and being put up. India is an upswing, you will never know that. So what I'm saying is that you need to, like we need to understand how this Indian dream is forever in the making. You know, when people talk about that, uh, you know, Modi ji has put India on the world map, I'm just reminded that it was in 2010 that President Obama visited India. And then he made the statement which everyone sort of lapped up, which was that India is not emerging, it has emerged. And that was 2010, we are in 2022 now. If we are still like selling this thing that India is emerging, I mean, there's some mind, mind boggling gap, you know, like, like we are in a suspended state permanently, permanently hoping, but never making it. Um, I just found the article, so I'll put it in the chat so others can look at it. But thank you so much. I found it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Durba. Uh, so, Raminder, there's actually a follow-up question to this discussion, which is by Sarabjit, and he says uh, that uh, you indicate that the Indian economy is an economy of hope where uh, there are achedin in the future, however distant that future may be. It seems it's almost expected that there'll be a cost that everyone must pay to achieve this economic growth. With the current protest triggered by the railway examination, do you think the economy of hope is now faltering? Have people reached a breaking point? Okay, thank you for this question. And in a way, it goes back to what uh, Professor Ghosh was just talking about, the breaking point, which I never got around, which is that actually the turning point, if there is, it is literally the farmers' protest. I think uh, when everyone was absolutely certain that uh, there is uh, no crack, like because we, we have been in the situation that people sort of know that there is inflation, you know, there is, you know, unemployment, 
nevertheless, it will all end up with, no, but we will continue voting for this government, right? And it has been very, very hard for political analysts to make an explanation, to make a sense of like, why would you do this? And then it all sort of cracks up with the farmers protest because that was, uh, you know, a totally unexpected kind of mass mobilization, which I would say one of the largest uh, mass protests which has taken place in the recent years. So now uh, that has sort of become a kind of, um, uh, uh, you see a kind of model that uh, has been, you know, we, we have been seeing a whole wave of protests. Uh, for example, there has been, you know, the banking, uh, you know, association of bank, uh, bank uh, employees, they held two days lockdowns. Um, and I must not forget students in universities have been protesting or uh, like this uh, question is asked that a major uh, protest emerged uh, because of, I don't know how many people are aware, but against the railway examination uh, stipulations. And I mean, and it has been amazing how, many of these young people who are literally hit hard by the growing unemployment. So in that sense, I would say that uh, we can never be certain, but what is pretty clear is that after two, uh, I think it will soon be two terms of the Modi regime. What we are all like experimenting, we are witnessing is how long will this hope last? That's one economic hope of Achedin. But then there is another, thing to it, which is that the very notion of what good times are that continues to be changed. And I think by now we have reached a point where, for example, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, where there is going to be elections like in a few, uh, few days actually, uh, basically the construction, ongoing construction of the Ram temple is being uh, you know, put forward as a big achievement. So what I'm saying is, that uh, the notion of good times. So this is where I said uh, dif distinction between what the Congress government stood for and what the BJP government stood for. In between, I had a couple of images, uh, uh, which is basically about um, of uh, you know Muslim entrepreneurs, and they, they they are very interesting, and they are part of that India Shining campaign as well, by the way. And uh, there, there was this idea that yes, you could be a minority in the country but you could still belong as long as you were in that in entrepreneurial uh, frame, right? A Muslim entrepreneur or Taj Mahal, which continues to earn and so on and so forth. But those kind of possibilities seem to be reducing and the very notion of what good times or dream world is continues to be uh, reshaped. I don't know if it uh, gives sense, but what I'm saying is that from purely economic, it has shifted into a cultural, uh, you know, cultural politics as well. So another question by my colleague Viranjani Munasinghe, and she says, I'm struck by the paradox you posed in the easy relation uh, between a sacred form nation and capital in the example of India shining. Through commodification of this kind, uh, nation is entering exchange circulation uh, but what is being circulated is the spirit or the personality of the nation, which is in theory inalienable, uh, say, unlike goods and services. Thinking about your wonderful images, is it the aesthetics that really create value in commodifying the nation? I mean, that's a great question. Thank you so much. And I think this, this precisely is the paradox we are talking about. And I think uh, this, I learned a lot from the branding literature, literally. I must tell you a little story that uh, one of the pioneers of uh, nation branding business actually was a historian. So I came across a pamphlet, which was a policy pamphlet, which was written uh, in the early 1990s, just when the world is sort of opening up. East Europe is opening up, Berlin Wall has fallen down. And uh, the idea that now, uh, you know, free markets can be brought uh, around the world. And this was written by a student of, and he's quoting Hobsbawm in that pamphlet to make a case for why nations need to be rethought as companies, as corporations. And this is what I'm of course laying out in my, in my uh, book as well, uh, that, uh, that surprise, surprise, the, the idea, like literally they are talking about Benedict Anderson of Hobsbawm. And I, I got extremely curious, who is this person who's writing this policy paper 
uh, you know, for, uh, you know, Robin Cook's, there was, a, there still is in London, uh, you know, a policy uh, organization. So literally this idea comes from that nations or corporations, corporations as in, you know, assembly of people making up a virtual person. If a company, so company is like a nation, all nations have to learn is to make themselves profitable. And this, this, is, this has become the, uh, this paradox or what seems a paradox to us is literally at the heart of the branding business. And the, that logic, paradoxical it might be, has become the mainstay of the nation states. At, at least this is my argument, because if you ask people, so what is it which makes India great? They're not going to talk about that, uh, you know, India is a secular, multicultural uh, place, you know, where everyone is living in harmony, but rather they would say, but you see, uh, so much foreign direct investment has poured in. So if you ask, so what has this government done? Well, it has brought in so many foreign, uh, you know, uh, reserves. Or uh, if you notice Indian politics, a favorite phrase which people often use is, the world stage, that India has emerged on the world stage. So everything is a performance, a spectacle, which continues to be uh, enacted. So what I'm trying to say is that this Indian difference, the very thing that India as this, uh, you know, uh, an exceptional different living being, which is literally the crux of the 19th century nationalism theory making, uh, that has been completely captured, packaged, and sold in the global markets. And let's be very clear, it's not just India uh, which is doing that. It is many, many countries along, around the world doing that. By the way, just to speak about South Asia, few people may have noticed that uh, our neighbor, Pakistan, has an emerging Pakistan investment program. It, it usually goes under the radar because it is in the finance capital uh, kind of world. And uh, or Bangladesh, by the way, has upset all the charts and has become one of the leading actors in this game of drawing investments. Or for that, that matter, Sri Lanka or Nepal, everyone, even Myanmar is on this game of capturing investments and which is what is upsetting the entire so-called geopolitical balance even within the uh, South Asian neighborhood. So in a way, what I'm saying is that what seems to us as paradox is precisely what is, uh, you know, leading this process. So uh, a few more questions. Uh, so one is by Siddhartha Pasu, uh, Professor Kaur, China like India famously also had hundreds and of uh, millions of excess workers in agriculture. But China decreed that entire provinces were turned into SEZs and industrial jobs were created. Uh, we saw Punjab farmers' incomes stagnate uh, while farmers in Andhra saw free market uh, bringing wealth. Do you think it was a mistake for the liberal elite to back rich farmers? It, it isn't it unfortunate that now make major agricultural reform will be blocked for 20 to 30 years? Okay, I, I have to say I disagree with this thing. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, for two reasons, I think... Um, I think all of us would agree that agriculture in India as such and Punjab, which was the frontline state in agricultural reforms, uh, needs some changes. But I think what people do not agree on is what kind of changes does it require? And the changes are, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the protest emanated from the fact that they could very see very clearly that uh, market reforms or basically, uh, you know, uh, um, like, um, allowing big corporations to come in uh, or, the, or the whole concept of uh, free markets, it's actually going to lead to dispossession. And here we must uh, remember that uh, not just in Punjab, but India as such, uh, you know, farm holdings are very, very small. Uh, and uh, we are speaking about, uh, you know, a couple of acres here and there, the whole whole, uh, you know, uh, categorization of who's a small medium farmer. I mean, literally, we are literally, India is made of small medium farmers. There are no big farm holdings. You can't compare it to America or anywhere else. So in other words, that uh, reforms are required, but it is certainly not uh, the, the free market reforms. And even when you compare uh, to any agricultural, uh, you know, setting anywhere in the world, 
it is literally subsidies are a very, very big part of it. And agriculture is a very, very fraught enterprise, a uh, risky enterprise. Uh, and the other thing, liberal elite, it was it a mistake to, I don't know which liberal elite was backing the rich farmers. What you could, first of all, as I said, there are no rich farmers here. So the second thing is, I don't know who the liberal elite is, but what we do know is that these protests became the, the starting point for something far bigger than farm reforms themselves. Meaning that they got conjoined with many different issues like freedom of speech, freedom, freedom of expression, or the general state of uh, you know, state control and repression, et cetera. So I just think that, uh, and the third thing I would say, well, unfortunate that uh, major agricultural reforms are blocked. Well, I'm not, I don't, I don't hope so because I don't think so because there are many people who are concerned about that. And hopefully, uh, you know, the whole question of sustainability in agriculture, which is also equitable and just will take place, not just in Punjab, but rest of India as well. Um. So another question, which is by uh, Swapnil Chaudhary. I am curious if you find any changes like nationalism or hyper-nationalism in the patterns of advertisements by companies. So I guess private companies uh, after the coming of Modi, of the Modi government. Uh, well, I think, yes, you can say so. If you are meaning those uh, you know, huge ads which are brought out in the newspaper, and uh, I think uh, in a way the word has got around, uh, you know, that if you want to do business, then you must be, uh, that you must not make the government unhappy. So the state capital relations are, you know, more, I mean, they always have been, but now they are more, uh, you know, uh, open about it, right? So you would not see those kind of ads where, so the prime minister indeed has become the face of this kind of interface between state and capital. So that's true. Because I do not recall uh, if uh, what I'm saying is first of all let's let's recall that uh, yes state and capital have always been entangled with each other so there is nothing new about it but the difference between the other governments and the present government is that this is uh, this is unabashed that uh, that uh, there is nothing hidden about it so this kind of open adv advertisements where you uh, you know thank the prime minister for, uh, you know, I mean, anything and everything, it has become the norm. So that is something new. Uh, other questions, comments, thoughts by anyone? I think there's a comment by Lena. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, she says, uh, Lena Sir, Thank you so much for the talk and your book, Ravinder. You lay out the brand logics behind so much that appears contradictory about the contemporary moment in India. Oh, okay, it was common. Okay, uh, thanks. So, other thoughts or uh, comments? Okay, so uh, please join me in, in thanking Ravinder for her uh, really thought-provoking talk. And please join us next week and subsequent weeks for uh, further events. Bye -bye. And thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.